Welcome to Sisters Voices, Francoise. Um, this has been a long-awaited interview, and I'm happy that you're finally here. You're finally here, and thank you for being here. So let me just ask you the first question, which is to please introduce yourself for our audience and to also tell us what is your strongest voice? Is it your speaking voice, your written voice, or your silence? Because sometimes silence speaks. Wow, thank you so much, Fudu. That's such an interesting question. Um, so my name is Francoise Mbouté. I'm the CEO of uh, the African Women's Development Fund. And uh, I think my most powerful voice is my written voice. And I say this because it's, it is the voice that scares me <laughs> the most, uh, because it's the voice that pushes me to be the most real. And uh, so, yeah, I would say my, my written voice might be my, my most powerful one. I really like the answer that you give um, because I've spent a lot of time on Iyala and reading all the different interviews you give. And I partly, this podcast was inspired by some of the conversations that you had on that blog. Um, oh. So I have this um, pressing question is, where does the need to give voice and create space and build community come from in you? Where did that drive come from? Oh, that's great. It's a great question. I think, um, I don't know. I, I would say that I always wanted to listen. I am a huge listener. I think for me, I love, um, I, I don't remember people's faces, but I remember everybody's voice. I love listening to people. And I've always wanted to know about the people whose voices I didn't get to hear. Uh, and and then when I realized there were people whose voices I wasn't hearing, I started wondering why. Um, and then, like, so I kind of, as I grew, I, those questions kept getting deeper and deeper. So when I realized there were uh, some injustices around who gets to speak, uh, I also then realized there were some nuances about when we hear people speak, what do we hear them speak about? So, for example, I found them found that very interesting looking at the adult women around whom I, I was growing. Um, they were all speaking and the men were speaking. I come from Cameroon, right? I mean, women are not quiet <laughs> in Cameroon. But what are they speaking about? I found so fascinating that conversations that my my father and my uncles were involved in were a lot about agency and power. And uh, the conversations that my mother and aunties were part of were about um, suffering a lot and also about uh, selflessness, uh, how they were valuing each other for being selfless, for giving it all to their families. I just found those nuances uh, interesting and yeah, so I kind, I kind of as I grew, I just always grew interested in what are we hearing, what are we not hearing, and the politics of all that. And I just wanted to make sure that we all have the the same access to speaking our full minds. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I would say. But I just made it up. I don't really know. <laughs> it's very <laughs> okay. okay. I never thought about that before. Thank you for your answer. You mentioned wanting to always listen to people. Um, on the back of listening, I feel like sometimes in society, people find listeners to be people who are voices or there's a conception or misconception that people who listen often uh, or are quiet have no voice. So I wanted to ask you, have you ever felt voiceless in your life and how did you navigate that experience, that feeling or that experience? Hmm. I don't think I've ever felt voiceless. Actually, this is a, a world that I I find irritating, especially when it's been used in the in that phrase, the voice of the voiceless. Because I don't think anybody is voiceless. Uh, I think people are ignored when they speak uh, and when they speak for themselves. People are not giving a chance or or a practice of speaking for themselves, but I don't know that there's such a thing as voiceless. Um, but to answer your question, I I think when I feel most, um, when I find that it's most challenging for me to to speak uh, and to own my voice is either when I am 
in pain or when I am um, confused. And I do find that actually, I was speaking about my writing voice. I think I write to figure things out, uh, to sort out things. And the, the writing has been what has helped me go out of like this feeling of voicelessness. Um, the, the, the writing, the journaling, and it really doesn't come easily for me. It really feels like pulling teeth, but it's really uh, useful. It's a useful tool for me to figure out what is in my mind so I can end up uh, eventually speak my mind. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Writing kind of offers you this plain space, whereas your mind sometimes, or when you're speaking, your mind and your words can get mixed up when you're writing. There's only one, unless you're ambidextrous and you can write with two hands, but there's only really one hand with which you can kind of pen things. Obviously, we have technology now, so that has changed. But I really appreciate that response. You also mentioned when you were talking about listening to the conversations between men and women when you were growing up, that there was this um, separation between the topics that were being, dis being discussed. And in listening to th those conversations, can you, or you've come a long way from that part. So let me ask the question this way. Is there a way that you would hope to frame the conversations that are happening between men and women today around the topic of feminism? Because I've had several experiences in my life where I recently had a conversation where someone asked me if, what is feminism? Why do women feel the need to like put themselves above men? And I was kind of taken aback by the conversation because the, the question, um, but how do you kind of navigate the misconceptions of feminism between when men ask questions like that and the work that you are doing as a feminist? Huh. So for me, it's a, the question around feminism uh, and the challenges in that conversation, uh, I want to unpack a little bit uh, because it's not only a challenge when I have speaking with men. Uh, I think <laughs> Patriarchy uses the voices of many and, and not just men. And I've had very difficult conversations about feminism with women as well. So I just want to preface my answer uh, by saying that it's not just about men. But um, I, I, do, <laughs> I do find that the, the conversations that I have the most often with people uh, around feminism and people who do not understand it uh, is that they say they don't understand it, but when you, you speak with them, you realize it's not the lack of understanding, it's more fear. Um, and I, I think it's fear of uh, losing privilege or lo losing uh, the sense of self that uh, was given to them by, uh, when they are validated by patriarchy. So um, I have a lot of conversations with men around um, is feminism what women want to do now to take to take over? Uh, you know, all those... I mean, the, first of all, this is such a boring conversation. Uh, I'm so tired of having it. Um, and I find it, it lacks imagination. And so I think I've, I've kind of run out of uh, ways to, to have the conversation that don't just drain my energy. So uh, most of them, I just don't. <laughs> I don't engage anymore. But I, I do find that it's an important uh, conversation to have, especially if you have the energy for it. Uh, and I, I, the way I explain this is that it's about freedom. Uh, for me, it's really uh, the bottom line is that we all have a right to be free uh, and that our gender uh, shouldn't be used against us to de deny uh, women uh, and uh, not just women, you know, non-binary folks, and we all have a right to be free. And and I think it's so fascinating that uh, you will have discussions with men who will say exactly we, what we feminists say when they talk about race, and they don't understand it when we talk about when we talk about gender. Like it makes no sense to me. So I guess I just go back to the basics. Uh, is, is how I navigate it. And if, if somebody understands the, ba the basic of, uh, the basic principle of the right to freedom and to liberate ourselves from the shackles of patriarchy, then that's it, conversation over. If you understand the principle and you can apply it to other 
areas of your life. So there's no reason why you couldn't apply it to, to gender. And that's it. End of story. I love it. I love it. Also, the, part, the fact that you brought in the energy required to have these conversations because they are, quite frankly, exhausting. But yeah, thank you for your answer. I like to ask you, if you weren't bound by time and you could pick two people to have a conversation with, living or dead, who would you choose and why? And what would you ask them about? Mm. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I, uh, I was always fascinated by um, Brassa Michelle, uh, whom I had the privilege to work uh, with when I, at the beginning of my career, when I was working at the Elders, and I was, the, uh, I was like an assistant and was taking notes when she was speaking, and I was so um, in awe of her comments, of herself, the way she presented, the way she was fiercely and passionately advocating for the Elders to work on, on uh, on gender and women's rights. And at the time, I couldn't have the conversations with her um, that I would have wanted to. And so I've always hoped that I have an opportunity to do that. Um, I guess maybe the other person I would really like to talk to and sit down is my late grandmother, my late maternal grandmother, whose name was Pauline. And I spent so much time with her as a child, but she was so far away and she didn't, we didn't speak the same language. So our conversations were always superficial, but then everything about her was so deep. And I, I, I really, and I will always regret not having a chance to, to meet her in the deepness of what you could see on her face, in her demeanor, in her way of sharing with the world. I'm, I'm so intrigued by her life and her feelings, and I never had access to those, unfortunately. I, I hope you get to have the conversation with Grasa Michelle. The grandmother that I can understand and resonate with, my great-grandmother, she passed this year, she passed at 115, and we had the opportunity to sit and have these conversations with her. And some of the things she said that were really profound for me, but they were so such simple things for her life. Um, and I appreciate those moments. And thank you for sharing those answers. Kind of looking forward to the next generation. I, in the podcast I had with Karen and Malaika, we had a conversation about feminist future, some of the hopes and the fears that people have for feminist for a feminist future and I kind of want to ask because you are at this new place in your life where you are the CEO of AWDF and you have a vision for where you want to take um, this organization so I wanted to ask you what are your hopes and your fears for the future that you're building for this organization what are your hopes and your fears for the generation of women that are coming behind you or who will walk in your footsteps well my hope is that everything that we advocate for, that we fight for, and we really put everything in as feminists, that this is our, this, this is really everything for us, right? because feminism is not something that you, you do from nine to five in the office, and then you close the door and you go home and it's over, right? It, it transpires in everything, in our family relationships, uh, our friendships, uh, the way we show up in, in on the street, uh, everywhere, you know? Uh, and my hope is that the things that we aspire to just become a reality. I, sometimes it feels like such a distant goal and aspiration, but my hope is that we can really bridge the gap between um, aspiration and reality so that it becomes not a utopia, but our future, really our future and tangible future. Um, and I think it's it I see this as my hope both for for women in general, um, but also for for the work that I am hoping that we do as a, as a team at AWDF in the in the next years. Um, I just feel like there's so much that can be done that we've started that we that we are almost there. And I think 
it's really about the aspiration versus reality. And for me, when it comes to AWDF as an organization, I really think it's possible. And what it takes is to remember what is in our DNA. AWDF was created as a fund in a bold spirit by our three co-founders. Um, the spirit of owning our future, owning our reality, and uh, so nurturing our, our own movements ourselves by African feminists, for African feminists and African women. And I think what it takes to make that vision a reality today is uh, a level of um, innovation, boldness, that uh, I think as an organization grows, sometimes you become less uh, agile uh, in, the, in the name of being efficient. And I think for me, it's, I'm really hoping that the organization can, can renew its commitment to those values uh, and of course remain efficient while also be innovative, bold, fully unapologetically. I don't know how to do this word, to say this word in yeah, English. That's right. Unapologetically feminist. Completely feminist, like no questions, as as uh, our feminist chapter says, uh, for us African feminists, no if, no but, no how, no whatever. It just feminist full stop. Well, I realized then uh, that I didn't actually uh, speak on my fears. Um, so maybe I can do that. I think in general, what I, uh, I get more and more afraid of is um, that we as feminists are fighting patriarchy, a force that is so good at reinventing itself uh, so creative in its um, <laughs> evilness. I don't know if that's a word, but I guess sometimes I fear that patriarchy is more creative than we are in fighting it. Uh, and that is something that I worry about a lot because, I mean, the backlash is incredibly um, painful, uh, but also incredibly creative. Uh, the way the way patriarchy comes back comes at us as women is just it it infiltrates all the different parts. It's everywhere. It's it's renewing itself in ways that we as feminists are not always able to. Uh, so sometimes I wonder: is this is this fight like how do we? I'm not saying we should play dirty uh, the way patriarchy does, and I I would never say that we should, but I think there's something about us going outside of like our NGO approach to the work or, you know, like just be, use the full extent of our amazing creativity and put that in the work because that's what it will take, I think. So that, that's, that's a fear I have. Uh, and for the organization, I guess, mm, I don't have fears for the organization. This organization is amazing. I do sometimes wonder uh, it's such a daunting uh, spot to be, you know, in the in the CEO office of this amazing organization. Sometimes I fear, like I fear, I fear like am I am I am I really able to do this, you know? Uh, but I do feel the support of the team, and when I have those doubts, then I just go back to the team and I feel better. I actually had a question. Thank you for bringing up your fears as a, f a CEO, because that's what came to mind when you said I should find more questions. Um, <laughs> but the evilness of patriarchy, let me just touch on the evilness of patriarchy and how you said there's no need to fight that. I sometimes believe there's a need to fight that. I sometimes believe that the kind of high ground that feminist or feminism adopts in our approach to dealing with certain each issues needs to... I, I sometimes want to get in the debt and like fight, but then you realize it's more draining of your strength and your resources than, because patriarchy has so much resources. But yeah, that was just my take when you said that there's no need to fight dirty. Sometimes I want to fight dirty. Oh, sometimes I want to fight dirty too. <laughs> but I just don't think it's what is going to get us there. I think it might satisfy something in the moment, but I think as feminists, we are, don't forget that patriarchy is destroying. We are building. Oh, yes. 
fantastic builders. So I think the how of, of, of the building is as important as the what. And I think that's where I, I think sometimes that, you know, you know, fighting dirty might go against our, our goal to build something that will last. That is true. Um, I guess my final question for you would be, how are you keeping your voice or how are you maintaining your voice as the CEO of AWDF? And how are you navigating leadership for such a wonderful organization and finding laughter and joy in the demands of the role? Because a lot of people are aspiring to be girl bosses and like you, Francoise, me, I'm aspiring. I'm not, not a little for me, I'm aspiring to be a girl boss as well. So how are you kind of maintaining Francoise in this new role? You know, I am actually, to be fully honest, it's something I'm really struggling with. Um, I, I think, you know, before you, you referred to Ayala, the blog that I was, I was doing before, um, before I joined, and which I haven't really touched on for six months just because of the demands of this role. It's so interesting. I was paralyzed, actually, with my voice, using my voice in the first three months after joining. Because I was like, can I fully be me? Can I just speak about me when now my my name is associated with the organization? Can I just say whatever I want to say? Can I just uh, be as vulnerable uh, when I'm supposed to be the leader and leaders are not supposed to be, you know, weak or whatever? So I really struggled with that for months. And it has helped me some, some in a twisted way to find myself in situations where Silence was no longer an option, especially around like maybe February or so when um, uh, our LGBTQI uh, sisters and brothers and uh, and uh, all our folks um, from the community were being so viciously attacked. I didn't have time to think about my voice. I just had to use it. And, uh, and from that, I, I kind of uh, been saying sometimes the voice, you don't want to think about it so much. Sometimes you just have to, to use it because some situations demand it. So, so, yeah, I think I still have to find a balance between speaking as myself and speaking as um, the spokesperson for the organization and being, to, being able to know the difference um, and, and sometimes wondering if there's such a big difference. Uh, is the difference as big as I thought? It's something that I'm still I'm still working on, and and the other half of your question, which was about uh, finding joy, um, I just want to go back to this piece of advice that my predecessor uh, Theo uh, Theo Sowa gave me as she was leaving. She said, "Remember what gives you joy, and make sure you make time for it." Um, and for me, uh, it's been a challenge because this job is intense to say the least, high paced and like so many emails, so many meetings and finding the time. And I'm an introvert. Uh, I'm a quiet person. I must find quiet if I have to find joy. So that's something I'm still um, I'm still working on too. But for me, at the end of the day, the, the short answer is finding quiet. So I am really trying to build quiet into my schedule at home, I have kids, young kids who are not quiet at all, and at the office as well. So I'm somehow making it a very practical way, you know, making quiet spaces for thinking and for resting in my schedule and, and learning to say no uh, to requests for meetings, for conversations, for panel appearances and all of that. So I can be the leader I need to be. I need to, I'm, a, I'm a reflective person. I'm here to lead on strategy. So I need to think. And that's uh, finding the quiet is going to make a big difference. I'm not there yet, though. Still working on it. Uh, I think when you said um, your voice as a CEO and your voice as Francoise, I personally would like to say I would 100% love to hear both. I would love to hear Francoise. And I would love mm. to hear the CEO, whichever form you choose to give us as an organization. I think we will all, and personally, as individuals, we will all benefit from it. And thank you. I appreciate that. The welcome. On that note, I would like to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for giving us the opportunity and the chance to interview you. This has been amazing. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think this podcast is a great initiative. I love that you're working on it. So I can't wait to hear all the different episodes. Thank you again.